Well, kia ora, everyone. We meet today in very strange times, don't we? Uh, I'm taken back just a fortnight ago. We were here as a Shaw Vineyard Church celebrating our 30th birthday. Uh, we had um, uh, donut balloons, for goodness sake. Um, we celebrated the goodness of God at that time. The place was packed. There was a sense of energy and a sense of um, what, a, what a wonderful three decades it's been. Then just last Sunday, we were together again, different place, Pakari Beach, having communion at sunrise and just celebrating the goodness of God out in his creation. Well, the world's changed, hasn't it, in the last week and in the last fortnight. It's a vastly different world that we are in at the moment. As I think back over 27 years of pastoring, 30 years of Shaw Vineyard, um, I can think of some Sundays that we've kind of done it tough because of world events. Um, back nearly 20 years ago, 9-11 hit, and I, I vividly remember that Sunday as we tried to figure out what this all meant, and we gathered together really for consolation. Um, Pike River happened in 2010, uh, and I was overseas at the time, felt very distant at that time, um, and yet our church gathered, and I think Fran led us in that particular case um, in a sense of sort of being one together. And then just last year, at this time, this Sunday basically last year, we gathered in this place and we unrolled a, a big roll of paper and we wrote messages of love to our Muslim community in the wake of the terrible um, Christchurch attacks in the mosques and we were able to send that love on to our local Muslim community. And so we've done it tough at times over the years but at least in those times we were able to gather as a church, gather together, come together and console one another. But this time I'm here in the Shaw Vineyard Auditorium with a total of literally five people. Not hard to count how many in the congregation this week. So we have Sandy, who's one of our pastoral team. He's manning the desk in the film. Uh, Fraser, who's um, interning with us this, this year, making the coffee and um, providing some of the jokes. That's great. Um, we have uh, my wife, Fran, who's going to be doing a little segment later in our program this morning about a living altar. And we have Jenny Lennon, who I'll introduce you to in just a few moments, um, who is uh, head charge now at North Shore Hospital and is on the front lines of this whole thing. And so I'm very conscious today that we're speaking to a congregation very scattered. And so to you who are from Shore Vineyard, uh, morning congregation or evening congregation, for you who are in your homes today, uh, gathering with a small group, wherever you may be or whatever your situation, if you're part of our church normally, or if you're just watching in Auckland or somewhere in Aotearoa or, or, or indeed around the world with the amazing thing of Facebook, we welcome you. Consider yourself Fano, And our job from now is to be the best jolly church we can be to bring you um, encouragement uh, to bring you hope in the midst of a very real situation and we're going to be working as hard as we possibly can to see that happen um, we're going to need to keep contact in different ways we're not going to see each other every week now anymore and so keep an eye on our website keep an eye on um, the emails that I will be sending out to you from time to time each week and keep an eye on a couple of Facebook um, pages. There's the official Shaw Vineyard Facebook page, which is open to anybody who's listening to this. And our official kind of church announcements will go on there, where we're meeting, what's happening, when and why. And then we have another closed group, which is just for our congregation members, called the Shaw Vineyard Wharanui. I think you'll see that on your screen now. And if you are part of our church, we would love you to go there often, to ask to join it. We'll say yes straight away. And that's where we get to be community, to connect together. We have the opportunity then to be able to say, you know, I've got an extra pot of soup. Is there anybody in my neighborhood I could drop it off at? Or, you know, my neighbor needs this, or, you know, kind of I need that. And it gets us to be, you know, both giving and receiving when we need it or when we have some surplus that we're able to do. Well, COVID-19, who knew that word a month ago or even a fortnight ago, and yet now it's dropping off our tongues, it's on our social media, all sorts of things. What can I say? I'm, I'm not a medical expert, but, but please be safe. Please be careful. Please do what the government says. I think this is the time for us to, to, to um, believe what we're hearing in terms of official channels and to follow the protocols that they have. A couple of things that we're doing, though. This week, we're planning to open our vineyard center here at 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock every weekday. 
And we're gonna, what we're going to do is just going to put on the jug. We've got plenty of space so we can keep appropriate distance. But if you're lonely, if you're at a loose end, if you're not working, those sorts of things, just to be together, we can pray for each other, hear each other's stories. Um, we, want, we, we invite you to come and maybe bring your friends. And, and, and we can do that with numbers still at the moment. It may not be possible uh, for a long time, but at the moment we can. Um, so 10 o'clock to midday at least, that's what we'll be doing. Also want to let you know that tonight, 7 o'clock, if you're watching this before tonight, we're going to gather with as many people as would like to, and it's safe space, of course, to anyone who would like to or is able to um, contemplate um, sort of being like small church within homes or within their communities. We're going to need to have you know, ways of communicating, uh, gathering even, just in smaller groups. And so we're going to have a big brainstorm tonight about how we can make that work. So if you're a home group leader already with Shaw Vineyard, we'd love you to come. If you're just interested, we'd love you to come. Or if you've got some ideas, we would love you to come. So consider yourself invited. Well, as I said before, I have with me here Jenny Lennon. Why don't, why don't you come up, Jenny, who is one of the people, one of the staff on the front line. Are we in good um, space here, Sandy? We can be seen. That's important. We can't see our screens here, so forgive us being a little kind of um, uh, little rough around the edges here. But Jenny, tell us what you do firstly. Morning, everyone. Hi, Vic. Hey. Um, yeah, I am currently the charge nurse manager in radiology at North Shore Hospital. And I also cover Waitakere Hospital and interventional radiology and theatre. So kind of the manager of, well, the nurse manager of um, three departments over the, over the two sites. It sounds an incredibly big job in normal <coughs> times. Mm. Um, we're in COVID-19. Tell yeah. me about what happens with radiology at this time. Yeah, well, radiology is going to be very key um, mm. in the coming weeks and months um, you know, as most people know, um, you know, the majority of people that get COVID-19 can um, recover well at home, um, you know, just taking the normal measures. But, you know, for those sick patients that do become quite unwell, they we will be seeing those ones. Um, X-ray, chest X-ray and chest CT um, is going to be a extremely used yes. <laughs> diagnostic tool. And, um, yeah, we're expecting our department to get extremely busy over the coming coming weeks and months. We've got a lovely photo here that I think you'll be able to see on the screen of you and some of your nurses. Tell, yeah. me, tell me about your team, how, <laughs> how great are they? Yeah, I've got an awesome team. It's a very international team. I've got nurses right. from all over the world. Um, I've got about 45 or 50 nurses now. And um, yeah, they're just awesome, you know. They just mm. come in day after day, yeah. regardless of the stress and the pressure, and they just do their job so well. And yeah, I'm just really, really very proud of them. They are heroes, and, and, yeah. and you're, a, you're a hero to me at least. How are you doing, Jenny? Um, yeah, it's <laughs> it has been a pretty full-on couple of weeks, I won't, I won't deny. Um, it's, you know, it can be quite wearing when you're in strategic disaster planning meetings, you know, one after the other after the other, um, and you're kind of hearing the worst-case scenario, of the course. doom and gloom, which can be, you know, quite overwhelming. Um, <laughs> the other day I did have a bit of a meltdown in the tea room. I'd just come out of my third meeting and I got my breakfast at, I think, one in the afternoon. <laughs> oh and I was scrolling through my newsfeed on Facebook and it's just every single post is, is just COVID-19. So you can't escape it. And I, and I did just burst out crying because it just all got too much. And it was so good. One of the radiographers just came up to me and just said, Jan, just put your phone down. Yeah. Just stop scrolling. She said, just, you can't do anything about it, none of us can. Just listen to the six o'clock news, that's all you need, and just put your phone away. Right. <laughs> and it was kind of, she kind of told me off, and it was just what I yeah. needed at that moment, because it was just, it was too much. Yeah. And I felt so much better, I had a little cry, a virtual hug with her. A virtual hug, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And I just got up, carried on, and went into the next meeting, and actually felt so much better. Yeah. So yeah, so that's been quite a good strategy. Well, a virtual me. hug, I don't know what that is, yeah. but a virtual <laughs> hug to you too. Yeah, yeah, I don't approaches. even know if we can yeah, reach yeah, across the distance. <laughs> um, so, you know, that was a little bit of self-care for you, mm, I suppose, mm. um, as a nurse, as a mum, yeah. um, as an individual. Yeah. Tell us, what, what would you be suggesting for us, for yeah. our self-care? Yeah, well, it's something I've really had to think about over the last mm. week, to be honest, because, um, you know, I'm going to need it, we're all going to need it to kind of get through this, this next season. You know, mental health issues are going to be on the rise. Yeah. Anxiety, domestic violence, all yes. that kind of stuff we need to be really, um, you know, aware of. 
Um, you know, I've just jotted down a few things here. Yeah. One of them, like I just said, just turning off your phone, just yeah. not being constantly bombarded by the news. Yeah. Um, for me, it's getting with nature, getting to the beach. I do my morning walk on Milford Beach before yeah. walk, uh, work every day, and it's just watching that sunrise. Oh, you know, beautiful. every day the sun rises, the sun sets. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a guarantee. Yeah. And just having that time as that sun comes out over Rangitoto and spending that time with God is just what feeds my soul. It mm. can be different for each one of us, yes. but for me that's beautiful. something that's really important. Um, praying. Mm. I mean, you know, we got to pray. This is mm. God's going to get us through this season, nothing else. I've been praying Psalm 91 yeah. a lot, you know, speaking out the Lord's Prayer, um, just spending that time with God. It, the other night we just got together as a family and we just anointed um, everyone with oil. And that was a really, yeah, you know, special time that, yeah. you know, often in normal times, you know, we probably wouldn't have done that so much. So, you know, there are positives that's going to yeah. come out of this. Tonight, we're just going to have communion together as a family and just sit around and have a, and have a prayer time. So, yeah. yeah, prayer, getting into God's Word, just getting filled up every day mm. because, you know, He's going to be our strength through this. Um, finding distractions, whatever that may be for you. So for some, it could be cooking, gardening. Yeah. For me, I love decorating and... Yeah. <laughs> painting a new room in the house or, you know, I've got a grandchild coming soon. So doing yeah. up the nursery, that, that's a great yeah. distraction, you know, for me personally at the moment. Um, I think keeping perspective is a, really, is a really good thing, you know. It's quite easy to feel overwhelmed by this, but just keep perspective, keep that gratitude up. You know, we live in a beautiful country. I woke up this morning, the sun was shining. We've got yeah. the beach on our doorstep. I can still take the dog to the beach. Yes. You know, just those little things that... Um, yeah, having that grateful heart, I think, I think is good. And I think another thing is not kind of looking too far into the future, just oh, just so breaking too. stuff up into chunks. Like even the other day at work, I had so much to do and I literally just had to plan each hour and think, okay, well, I'm going to break the day down into chunks yeah. of one hour and right. prioritize what I need to do in each hour. Yeah. And that can be the same for us in our weeks and months ahead. You know, I mean, we've had our lovely two-week trip to Australia cancelled, as yes. I'm sure a lot of people have through yeah. this. There'll be no leave for me at the moment. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's just really taking each day as it comes and being thankful for each day and just, yeah, well, really just trusting in him. Fantastic ideas. I, I, I believe it was happy birthday yesterday. Yes. What did your family yes. do to well, celebrate your birthday? We just got together as a family and a couple of kids had their girlfriend and boyfriend around and we just had a family game of um, charades and board games and we just, yeah, just love that. got back to basics. Could have done that 50 and years We had a ago great, I know, all here. these things that we used to do that kind of, yeah, are coming back. And yeah. that's good. That's positive. Well, Jenny, thank you for coming and being with us in our somewhat echoey uh, auditorium this morning. Um, we've also, well, I know that you've written a prayer that we've asked you to come and bring. Yeah. So why don't you pray yeah. for, well, whatever God's led you to pray for. Sure. Yeah, I'm just going to pray and then just um, end with a few verses from Psalm 91. Lord Jesus, we just come before you now in these uncertain and troubling times. I pray your shalom peace over each and every one of us and over our nation. Thank you that you are our refuge, our fortress, and our safe place. I pray your precious blood over each and every one of us. We ask for your protection and that you would send your angels to guard us in all our ways. Jesus, in these anxious times, help us to focus on you and guard our hearts and minds from fear. Thank you that your perfect love casts out all fear. Help us, Lord, to focus on what's important, to get back to basics, to spend more time with you and our loved ones. I pray this would be a time of revelation and reflection, a Selah moment, a time to retreat from the hustle and bustle and consumerism of normal life. I pray this would be a time of divine reconnecting, restoring, and healing within our families, a time where relationships are healed, restored, and families are united. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would fill each and every one of us right now as we sit in our homes. I pray you would replace fear with hope, and you would surround us with your presence. Help us not to retreat from being kind and generous and give us the strength to show your love to those around us. 
And may your church in this time be a shining light in the darkness. I lift up all the health workers around the world who are on the front line fighting this battle. Give them divine energy, strength and protection and cover them right now in Jesus' name. We pray for our leader, Jacinda, that you would give her divine wisdom and clarity in her decision-making. We lift her up to you right now and thank you for her leadership in this time. We know that all seasons pass, and as we head into this storm, we thank you that with you on our side, the eye of the storm is actually the safest place to be with your loving arms wrapped around us. Jesus, right now, we choose faith over fear. Thank you, Jesus, that you are our hope. And just a few verses from Psalm 91. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Thank you. That is so beautiful. What a beautiful prayer. Um, this brings us towards or to the end of our um, this first segment that we're recording this morning. Um, and we hope you'll be with us for the other two segments um, in which I'm going to be do, uh, doing a, a wee message, uh, just eight or nine minutes, um, on Jesus is saying, you know, I'm going to be with you. Uh, and then Fran, my wife, is going to be doing a, a segment on how to create and make a living altar that we could um, go deep with God at this time. So we'll sign off for now. You'll be able to click to the next one if you've got time to, or you can do it whenever you like. But God bless you. Thank you again, Jenny. And, um, you know, wherever you are, stay safe. And we look forward to connecting with you week by week through this time. Well, welcome everybody to the Shaw Vineyard podcast of this morning's service in very, obviously, diff diff difficult and different circumstances. Uh, you may have seen already our introduction uh, where I talked to Jenny Lennon from uh, North Shore Hospital about, um, about uh, working with COVID-19, or you may be just joining us for the first time on this clip, uh, in which case, you know, welcome and God bless you this morning. Um, for the last three weeks, I've been planning... Uh, this Sunday's sermon to be entitled, Behold, I am with you always. Um, and if God has given me any word, I feel, to offer consolation and inspiration this morning, this would be it. Behold, Jesus says, I am with you always. Virtually the last promise of Jesus that we read in Matthew 28 is the back part of the Great Commission. Or in the message, which I think we'll see on the screen, it says, I will be with you day after day after day, day after day after day, the promise of Jesus that he will be with us. And this is the same Jesus who was introduced to us in the very first Christmas as Emmanuel, God with us, Emmanuel, God with us. And the same Jesus who said he would be leaving us, but instead we would receive the Holy Spirit who is variously described in the scripture as the helper, the comforter, the advocate, and the friend. And don't we need a helper, a comforter, an advocate, and a friend at times like this? As I put that together, it seems like God with us is with us always. Our God, our Emmanuel, God with us, is with us always. And God is with us in our very real, everyday lives, such as a COVID-19 pandemic and all the uncertainty and confusion that comes with that. He is with us. Henry Nouwen, one of the great contemplative figures of the last 50 or so years, writes, he says, as soon as we call God, God with us, we recognize God's commitment to live in solidarity with us, to share our joys and pains, to defend and protect us, and to suffer all of life with us. And on the screen, the God with us is a close God, a God whom we call our refuge, our stronghold, our wisdom, and even more intimately, our helper, our shepherd, our love. That is the God who we are serving in good times and hard times. I can't help feel that it's we're a little closer to biblical times than we were one long week ago. In the book of Acts, the early believers met from house to house, and we know some particular houses that they met at. We have their names, Cornelius's house, 
Mary's house, Justice's house, and Lydia's house, among others who are not named. And I know that some who are listening to this message are meeting in homes. This, after this service, we're going to one of our congregation houses, and we're going to meet together. And, and I'm looking forward so much to being together in houses. We get to add our names to those lists that we see in the book of Acts. And then we feel a little closer to biblical times because some of the scriptures, to be honest, seem so much real, more real this week than they might have last week when Jesus says, you know, not to worry about tomorrow, but to think about today and to be related, you know, kind of where God is today. I think it's a great piece of wisdom that we could well apply. When Jesus in Mark 4.39 walks on the water and says, peace be still, to the waves. Oh, that's the Jesus that we want to know. When David writes in Psalm 23 that he leads me beside still waters, this is the God that we are encountering or needing to encounter at this time. And incidentally, Psalm 23 says, for you are with me. A bit of a theme of the morning, you are with me. And so it feels like we're a little closer to biblical times right at the moment. It feels also like we're somewhat closer to the history of our Christian church. You will have heard it said often this week that we've never been this way before. Well, yes, that's so true. And yet, no, it's not so true if you look at the history of the church, which has absolutely been this way before. And some of the most magnificent responses of the church have happened in um, unforeseen and unfortunate times. Back in the third century, the plague of Cyprian went ripped through Europe, and it said that 5,000 people a day were dying in Rome. 800 people died yesterday in Italy of COVID-19. A huge number, but we've seen something of this before. And Dionysius, the Bishop of Alexandria, recorded that Christians showed, and here's his quote, unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need, and ministering to them in Christ. And yes, some of them died. Uh, it wasn't just this you know, kind of bubble. It was very real life that took place then. And we trust that that won't be um, our, our destination, but, but we see in the, uh, just the wonderful response that Christians can make in difficult times. Dionysius also said that those who weren't in the church deserted those who began to be sick and fled from their dearest friends. And that's something that we're, we're not willing to do. That's not it's something we're not going to do. In the 16th century, Martin Luther, who you may have heard of, a, a great reformer, had plague coming back through his town. It had swept through, swept through again. And he urged Christians not to flee, but to remain steadfast before the peril of death. And he challenged Christians to tend to the sick as if they were tending to Christ. And he quoted Matthew 25, from which in the church, not our sort of church, but, but in, in lots of churches, they talk about the corporal acts of mercy. And that's things like feeding the hungry and giving a drink to the thirsty um, and visiting the sick uh, and so on. And, and this may be the things that we're called out to do. Luther wasn't sort of, you know, plunging recklessly into the middle. He said, God, I ask God mercifully to protect us. And then I'll fumigate, help purify the air, administer medicine and take it. You know, he was very, very realistic in this. Um, he said he'd avoid places where he could spread it, avoid places where he'd get it. But he said, if my neighbor needs me, I shall not avoid the place or person, but will go freely. The best character of church history that I can think of, because I just love what she said, is, is a lady called Julian of Norwich, who in the 14th century in Norwich in England saw the plague sweep through her town, not once, not twice, but three times, killing members of her family, um, but obviously not her. And she's one of the great, um, I don't know, inspirations I think we can take. And this is such a memorable quote, which we've quoted in our church often, but may well need more, uh, or be more real to us now. But she said famously, all will be well, and all will be well, and all manner of things shall be well. And there is the sense that the, that would be glib unless it came from somebody who had been through the plague three times. And we, as, we, as we connect with God like that, we are going to see his touch, and that is what we need to be looking for. This is our time to be similarly trusting as our forebears have been. This is our time to be kind, like our Prime Minister wonderfully urges us as a nation to be. This is our time to be brave and caring and generous. This is our time to go deep into our faith and discover afresh the God who calms the storm and says, peace, be still. This is our time to be a people of faith who love each other and the world as Jesus does. 
This is our time to be careful and stay safe, yes, but not to retreat to behind closed doors in fear, no. This is our time to find new ways of connection, to look out for each other, for our families and for our neighbours. This is our time to imagine, to reimagine what it would be like if together we can represent Christ in this world. As we have the promise that God with us is always with us, so too we have the sense that together we can make a difference at this time. We wish you well. We pray for you. God bless you in this time in whatever situation that you are in. And let's together be the church that's going to make a difference. Do keep in contact on um, the various aspects, our Facebook page, page Shore Vineyard Facebook page, our Shore Vineyard Wharanui page. Keep an eye on our website and the emails that come through. That's really important. Next Sunday, probably in a different context than this, we will be putting together the beginning of our Easter series for the next three weeks. That is going to be fantastic. And also, um, at the end of this clip, there'll be another clip that you can go to where Fran, my wife, is introducing us to what she calls a living altar, a way of praying, a way of connecting with God in a way that's going to be life-giving to us in these difficult times. Let me pray for you quickly, and God bless you. And so, God, we just present ourselves in our, our homes, with our friends, with our families, in lockdown or in, um, you know, kind of whatever situation we're watching this. Yeah, we commit to you our fears, we commit to you our needs, we commit to you our loved ones. And Lord, we ask that you would come close. God, who is with us? We say, come and be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Kia ora koutou. Here we are meeting in digital space for church. I hope you uh, had a chance to listen in or watch uh, our previous segment, which was uh, Vic... Uh, speaking to us and bringing, a, I thought, a wonderful message, leaning back into the history of the church, which is just so helpful for now. I'm Fran, if we haven't met before, and something you may or may not know about me is that I mainly work as a spiritual director, which means that I spend time in my work with people, listening to their relationship with God, what's happening, what's not happening, where they feel connected, where they don't feel connected, not as an advice giver, but as someone who is noticing with them where God is with them. And so with is very much a key word for us at the moment, I think. So my spiritual direction work really lends itself to this strange time that we find ourselves in. One of the things I'm conscious of as a spiritual director is that when a time of crisis happens or we feel a bit blindsided, the normal ways of praying somehow don't feel quite the same. Sometimes they don't feel adequate at all. And so I just want to reassure you about that, that that's quite normal. And so you might find that it feels a little bit like your prayer has dried up or you're not quite sure how to approach God. And so over the coming weeks, we're going to introduce you uh, along with us. I don't want to make it a, a, a you and us kind of a thing, but together we're going to explore ways of praying that will deepen our relationship and connection with God and others, no matter what's going on around us. Simple ways, ways that have been life-giving for people both in the church and in some ways people outside the church for a long, long time. So one of the key things to know is that prayer is many things. If we simply say that prayer is talking to God or prayer is just listening to God, we've reduced it to just one or two things, and that shuts down a whole lot of other channels. But as humans, we have five senses. Um, God speaks to us through all of those things. So now might be the opportunity to open up some new channels for connecting with God's Spirit. So we're going to talk today about creating a living altar. This is a wonderfully simple way to pray. You don't have to have any special creative skills. You need only the things that are around you in your own environment. So it's a way of praying that uses our eyes, um, taps into our, our inner feelings and intuitions, and connects us deeply with God because the things that we notice or are drawn to are often the things through which God wants to speak to us. Creating a living altar also connects us with the domestic church. We focus largely on corporate church, church that meets in our beautiful whare karakia. But at, at home right now, you're meeting in your own whare. So 
The domestic church has been part of Christian experience since the early days. The earliest, in fact. So what happens at home is just as vital and spiritual and deep as what happens corporately. So we just want to really encourage the leaning into the domestic church and what it has to offer us and how we can do church as we are at home. A living altar allows us to involve others as well. So whether it's the children just kind of noticing on their way home from school while they're still attending, whether there's a flower or a stick or a stone or something that they want to pick up on the way home that says something to them that they can put on the altar that you're creating at home as a family. Or if you're flatmates, you know, you could do it together um, at the end of the day. Personally, I love the end of the day for this kind of practice because it gives us a chance to kind of really quiet and down. But also, it, it's often the time when we might be heading for bed and finding that our mind is just uh, racing, our innards are churning, and so this practice brings us into a lovely sort of ref reflective and quieter space. And also, you'll know, if you know me at all, that I love candles. So it's the ideal time, night time, for the lighting of a candle. Candles are good for us. Candle light is actually really good for humans. So turn off all of the, the bright lights at home and sit in the gentle light of a, a little flame and just let that connect you with God as well. So how do we do a living altar? Well, it starts with our intention. You might want to notice a particular feeling that sort of sits on top for you and that you'd like to open that up to God. So there's your prayer intention right there. Then you just look around your own environment and see the things that sort of flirt with you. What's catching your eye? And so that's a bit of an act of faith in a way to to take that step and go, okay, well, I don't really understand it, but I'm going to take it and put it on my altar, which is just a table or a shelf. You might like to create something a bit special. It could be on a tray, if you like, just however you want to do it. Just noticing objects, both natural, um, from the garden, um, or just things that you have in your own possession that are around you. And just let them be the means through which God uh, open something up for you, or that you offer something to God. So I'm going to talk you through my personal altar, my living altar, that I created last night. So I started with sort of the sense of, well, there were two things really. One was my family, that we and Vic, uh, Vic and I had just said goodbye to uh, my dad, whose 90th birthday it is this week, and his mum, who is 92 and the sense that they've now been told that they need to stay home. And alongside that uh, is also my, my son, who falls into the vulnerable category of people due to type 1 diabetes. So he's in the same boat as his grandparents, actually, and is, is feeling that vulnerability. And I'm feeling it too, as a mum and as a daughter and as a daughter-in-law. So my family were very much in my mind. But also the sense that this is a pandemic, Everyone is affected. So I had those two things of everyone and specifically my family. So here's how it played out for me. I have a, this rickety old globe, which I love. So I thought, hmm, this is a good way to just say to God, I'm thinking of the whole world, but it's too big for me to really think about. But here it is. I'm bringing that before you, God. I noticed on my shelf this little stack of prayer books and it struck me that I hadn't realized how long my family had been prayers. Huh. So I have one little set of prayer books from my mother's side of the family, the Irish-Australian convicts. So these are from 1892. And this one from my dad's side of the family, the Nicholsons, um, Presbyterians and also Free Church of Scotland uh, from 1898. Huh. So the sense that actually my family have been bringing things before God for a long time. That was very grounding and consoling. You may not have those kinds of things going on. That's fine. You do you. But I'm just kind of talking you through how it was for me. 
it then struck me that perhaps things that my children had given me was a nice way of representing um, my affection, concern, and love for them. And so they will probably recognize themselves as these things make their way onto my personal altar, my little living altar. And really, you just place things in a way that sort of feels harmonious to you. You don't have to do anything fancy. It's just kind of move them around until you kind of go, yeah, that feels nice, that feels finished. Don't want to set those dried flowers on fire. We'll just move that slightly. It's always good, too, to have that sort of sense of something that really represents your faith, represents God. So for me, someone gave me... Um, a little wee icon of the Holy Trinity, and there's a lovely circular nature to this, which is very inclusive. And so we are held in the love of the Trinity and within that relationship. The whole planet is held within that. It's like, oh, that's big, but it also holds me, and that's consoling and good at this time. So there's my, my God piece, if you like. It's also good to see whether or not there's a, a word or a phrase that arises, a little insight or piece of wisdom that comes to you from the Holy Spirit. Or it might be something that you simply want to say which could be expressed in one word. You know, as life kind of shrinks down for some people, there might be grief or frustration, fear, anxiety. There might be gratitude for simple things. So just notice the word that sits on top or phrase for you, whether it's something from God or whether it's something you want to say to God, either way is fine. For me last night, it was this little simple phrase, held in love. My little blackboard is a bit wonky, so we'll just balance it there. The last piece for me was my holding cross. This is a very simple way of praying, is simply to hold and to be held. And there you go, that echoing of held in love. It's like, ah, oh, somehow it all comes together. So my holding cross is made from New Zealand Kauri, was given to me by a friend. It's made out of a pew from St. Benedict's Church uh, in Auckland City when they were renovating. So this lovely little cross was very much part of my prayer last night, which really had no words but it was the holding and these objects and sitting in the candlelight with God. These things expressing my prayer and receiving something back from God in that. So I'm just going to light the candle because it just doesn't seem right without the candle going. So you can create a living altar each day if you want to. Or it might just want to sit as it is for a while and you might change it up each week. I'm going to be posting my living altars on Insta just because it helps me keep the practice going. And you might like to do the same thing. We'd love to see yours. Not to say it's a competition. It's not. It's simply an act of faith and we're encouraging one another as we do so friend of mine in the States saw my post from last night, and she's going to do it herself too. So who knows, we might start something viral of our own, eh? So I just want to draw your attention to the church living altar. This is our Shaw Vineyard one that I made. And so you might recognize the house with all the lit windows um, that represents our whare karakia, the gift uh, to us a couple of weeks ago at our celebration. So that's the, that represents all of us, that beautiful house illuminated from within. We've got our big ball of yarn, so you know we're all part of the narrative thread of this church community, but we're all in the God story, so our big ball of yarn is there, and it reminds me too of Ubuntu, and it makes me think of the bundle of life in which we all exist. So there's our, our big ball of yarn. And that our prayer was that God would continue all through this year and beyond, that God would knit us together like one of Judy's jumpers. So there's the giant knitting needles that I, I promised that we would have and uh, that Sandy helped me make. And we've started knitting that yarn into something. God is still 
making us one. And so that's been our theme for the year, hasn't it? Becoming one. So one is the word on the little um, board there. One is not a singularity. One is a unity. So in this, we're all together, aren't we? And so that's what we're continuing to um, lean into in this time. The icon was written at a time where the church was splitting. It was breaking in half, east and west. But the person who wrote this icon, the theologian, understood that we still need to recognize our oneness in Jesus and abiding in the vine. Well, the vine is part of our vineyard language, clearly. So Vic and I bought this icon when we were in Greece a few years ago, feeling that it very much represented us as a church and that in the vine, uh, we draw our life from Christ, which is how we are to read this icon, actually. And that when all around us seems to be falling apart, that abiding still holds. And that any one of those people, the disciples that we see here, the evangelists, they all stuffed up majorly. And yet here they all are, held and growing in the vine, just as we are. So that's representing our church at the moment. And lastly, the big bazooka candle, which we normally light at Easter, here it is, glowing already as a sign of life and hope and the presence of Christ. So the beauty of beeswax is that it represents, um, it represents Christ in that it's not made by human hands. Beeswax is made by bees. The cotton wick represents the human nature of Christ. So that bit is very much connected with us. Jesus is not separate from us, but he has those two natures that come together in the one thing in him, God and humanity. And then the flame represents the spirit. So here we are with this wonderful beeswax candle that really says everything that can be said about Jesus. So I'm suggesting if you want to get a candle for home, try and get a beeswax one if you can. The other thing that, about beeswax is it smells lovely and it ionizes the air. It's just good for us. So it's not magic. We're not saying any of these things are um, charms or protective practices. They're just a way of grounding ourselves in love. We are so loved. And this is where we will find our kindness to offer others, our kindness to ourselves, and experience the kindness of God in this very uncertain time. So I'm hoping that you might find this an enjoyable and lovely way to pray. As we go forward uh, in these coming weeks, we're also going to develop a practice of having communion or Eucharist together. So Eucharist just means thank you. Isn't that a wonderful name for a meal? And so we'll be able to do it with tea and toast at home, or you might want to make a loaf of bread, or we'll find ways of doing it that are engaging for each of us and come together and, and share it in this digital, virtual space where we can still be very real to one another and deeply connected to God and to each other. So I'm looking forward to seeing your living altars and um, yeah, I will just close now with a, a blessing. So loving God, bless us as we gather and as we scatter Bless us as we walk through this time. Help us recognize you with us. And we thank you that nothing can separate us from your love. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>